listening to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network, the nonprofit organization that strives to address the staggering disparity in resource availability for individuals suffering from mental health disorders, processing disorders, addictions, trauma healing, and sexual identity challenges. Together, we strive to end the stigma associated with these challenges so that true healing can begin. Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network. I'm your host, Ange, and welcome you to episode number 35. Today, we welcome Grammy-nominated lead guitarist and founder of the band Great White, Mr. Mark Kendall. Mark was born into a musically gifted family. He grew up in Huntington Beach, California. His father played jazz trumpet. His mother sang her heart out to jazz tunes before adoring audiences. His grandfather, too, was a virtuoso on the piano. Citing Jimi Hendrix, Cream, and The Doors as early influences, Kendall's passion and natural abilities got him hooked on guitar. Since 1982, the Great White Sound has captivated audiences worldwide with crushing blues-based guitar riffs and swagger that invokes an emotional high for anyone that listens. Best known for their Grammy-nominated Best Hard Rock Performance hit, the gold-setting Once Bitten, Twice Shy, which has over 900,000 copies on this single alone, Great White has sold over 10 million albums worldwide, has six top 100 Billboard hits, nine top 200 Billboard albums, two multi-platinum albums, five gold records, and clocked the top of MTV videos four times. For Mark, while music business has changed dramatically since he first picked up a guitar, he still believes in human connections and imperfections which is why he's a perfect fit for our Coffee and Conversation podcast. Mark is a solid supporter of Music Cares, where his relentless efforts to help those seeking a sober life have been expressed in feature stories on Fox News and numerous national radio programs. He is a baseball enthusiast, he loves the Dodgers, and boasts professional skills in billards and poker, all of which he's showcased on the popular Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Whew! This is an amazing episode, so fill up your coffee, sit back, relax, and let's get started. All righty. So listeners, we are recording this on Friday, November 10th. It's not going to be released on Friday, November 10th, but... Today it is, I'm in Los Altos, California. It is a beautiful sunny day here in Los Altos, California. And yet I am super stoked to interview Mark Kendall. And I am going to allow him to introduce himself and then we'll get started. So Mark, please tell us why you're here today. Well, um, my name is Mark Kendall. Um, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a guitar player and I'm a sober advocate. I've been reaching out to people for about, I guess, 12 years now. So I've worked with uh, probably about 150 people one-on-one and also tried to inspire people out there that are suffering or, you know, maybe are thinking about getting sober, but really don't know the road to travel. So I just, all I've done is is offer my sober friendship encouragement support you know i I always tell people that i'm always available to be a sober friend and when i get together with them one-on-one i basically just tell them how i did it i'm not out there promoting any rehab centers or 12-step groups or anything like that but when i because i keep true to principles and whatnot. But when I get together with them one-on-one, I tell them exactly how I got sober, how I've been able to stay that way. And, you know, maybe they can take a couple things from that, uh, you know, apply it because obviously what they're doing isn't working so good. So, you know, um, so that that's basically it. I, 
you know, get a lot of gratification to see sick people get well. And that that's really about it. Well, we have a lot in common then. So that that is amazing. So how about why don't we start and maybe just tell a little bit about why you became so passionate about this work. And I will say, I know one of the challenges that I have is that it is a struggle to work with individuals who want a better life. And yet it is super hard. So I'll be vulnerable here. I shared that I went into rehab as a consequence of, of my kidnapping. And yet still today, I still struggle to not drink alcohol. And it's a constant struggle. And I'm a very successful professional, very educated. I've done six Ironmans. I'm very resilient. And so I can conquer a lot of things. And yet when the stress gets high, then alcohol seems easy. It seems like the solution. However, it's not. And so I know it can be a struggle working with those individuals. So can you maybe perhaps talk a little bit about that journey that you have? Well, um, the the main thing, you know, um, is realize that the time is going to take care of itself for one thing. So you're not like, don't come in saying you're, I'm going to stay sober forever or whatever, you know, throwing up these impossible tasks in front of yourself, uh, impossible goals. So um, I think just staying sober one day at a time is like, that's something I hold on to for dear life. And the other thing, when I work with people, I try to identify their triggers. What is it when you get really mad? Do you just say, oh, F it, I'm going to go drink? Or, you know, is is it when you're depressed? If you identify all those triggers, when one comes in and says, oh, you want us to drink, that voice starts happening, you can just kind of shoot it down and realize that's one of my weak areas, but I'm going to fight through this. And the other thing is when you get a little a physical itch, uh, urge to want to drink, that urge lasts two minutes only. It's it's a two minute, you know, two minutes roll by and it's going to go away. So if you can get through those two minutes and then um, just kind of take your lumps with what you're going through, it, it always passes by. And the next day, or maybe even a few hours later, you're so happy that you didn't blow your time over this adverse moment that it, it, it's just really rewarding. The, the whole thing, I always keep everything stupid simple. I mean, dumb guy simple. I mean, I'm talking, I, well, I won't use that word, but... Um, you know, when I roll out of bed every day, I just pray to, you know, that I can be sober one more day. I've literally done that for 15 years. I I never take my time for granted. I I celebrate like a mo. I might celebrate, you know, like for a week when I get some milestone. But I don't hover on it in a way like, you know, make that big of a deal. And most of the reason I overly celebrate is so other people can see it as opposed, you know, it's it's like if I'm a bowler and I won the tournament, I'm not going to just hover on my trophy for like a year. And just, you know, just think I about how great I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, so. My precious, my precious. <laughs> yeah, my precious trophy. <laughs> You know, so I just, I kind of, uh, I like to do everything for, I'm I'm out to inspire people, you know, um, I'm never anonymous, I, I don't want to be anonymous, I want to make a huge deal about what an alcoholic I am, and you know, how I kind of found a way to to sustain sobriety, and it's not easy. But I, I know that there were times where I was, like, I wanted to get sober, but I just didn't. It's like, all I needed was maybe an encouraging word or some dude to say, hey, you should try this, bro, because you're going through all that pain and stuff. 
it's kind of, you know, I really feel bad for you. You know, you should try this. And that's really about all I needed, you know. So I know there's people out there that that kind of they're sick of the pain, you know. They're and but they just they don't make the the first step into like trying the sobriety thing. And you know, everybody told me that my life would get better. And I remember I had the sponsor and everything because you got to realize I've, I've been trying to get sober for 17 years and, and having a lot of white knuckle time, like I'll go two years without drinking, but didn't do anything about changing myself or, or my alcoholic behavior. So I, I did that and I kept going back and trying it because I was jealous that people could drink normal. I just, there's got to be a way I can do this, you know, and just be the normal dude that watches the game and has a beer. You know, what's the deal? This is re just ridiculous. And so I kept trying it, kept failing, failing and failing, you know. So finally, I did give in and, you know, uh, listen to people. But that's really my story in a nutshell. I, At 34 years old, I was getting a lot of pain. I'd, I'd wake up feeling awful and I'd go, oh, all I have to do is drink four beers and everything's going to be fine, <laughs> you know. But I ended up doing what I call chasing normal, which is, is it's not like I want to be wasted out of my mind at 10 a.m. It's just I don't want to feel crappy either. And I, I found that the alcohol, were, you know, kind of worked. But then it wears off and you keep running after normal. It's like you're you're running a marathon to try to, you know, do all this work just to feel okay and not have pain. And and I got so sick of it and that and then I'd start again. But I, I didn't get any help. I didn't do any self work. I didn't work on my character defects. I didn't, you know, try to change in any way. I was still lying to everybody about, you know, the way an alcoholic does, you know. I used to tell my wife I, I had a hamburger when it was pizza. I mean, it was that bad. Like, I just thought I was supposed to lie. You know, it, it just goes with the territory. So I'm a changed man. I've seen a lot of people get well. It, it's been a, a heck of a ride. I love to get involved. I, I'll fly to somebody celebrating their one year. I mean, literally, <laughs> I've, I've done it, you know, or I'll go speak at a meeting for somebody. I've had friends, a friend to celebrate five years. It's it's a darn miracle. I've been working with that guy forever and ever and ever, and he just kept going out, coming back, going out, coming back, going out. I never gave up, and he has five years. So, you know, I get to that look at amazing. that a lot. Yeah, getting to look at people get well is, is especially, and even physically, like their appearance completely changes you know all of a sudden they they just these beautiful people doing great you know there's nothing wrong with that i mean you, your world does change i remember going to my sponsor i had a sponsor you know the guy you call when you're getting a bad thought, <laughs> but you're supposed you know? to call before you drink <laughs> yeah, when that exactly. telephone is so freaking heavy <laughs> exactly and i you know, everybody was telling me that my life was getting better. And I'm like three and a half months in, right? And I go, bro, I go, I totally believe, you know, what you guys tell me about, you know, my life's going to get better and this and that. But it ain't happened yet, <laughs> you know, but it did happen. And you're not going to believe it. I mean, things changed for me. Things started to go my way. My finances, everything got great. Um, it, it's just crazy. And so I wanted to hold on to that, you know, and I kept doing what everybody said. Am I doing this right? You know, you know, and, and just listen, took direction, you know, and, um, you know, after I had about three years, I started working with people and, and kind of, you know, because I'd been through the learning process and kind of, I go, man, maybe if I, I'll just want to see what happens. If I reach out on Facebook and just offer my sober friendship, maybe somebody out there is like struggling or, you know, they might get a hold of me and maybe, maybe the, something will change for them. So it just started like that. And I, the first guy, you know, I'll just end this, but the first guy I worked with, 
he I got him into a rehab. He was dead broke. So through the, a place called Music Cares, kind of what you you're doing uh, to raise money for grants and to get people in rehab. So anyways, they got him into a place called Cumberland, where his wife actually worked as a counselor. And he went in a five year period, he went from patient to counselor himself. I love so, when I hear those stories. Yeah, like, so when I got to look at that, I'm just going, holy cow, where's number two? You know, where, where's the third guy? And and I just kept going. And now I'm like well into the 150s. I send out meditation and prayers every day. You know, we're kind of this online group and stuff. You know, we celebrate when people, you know, hit a milestone. I'm uh, inviting myself to your online yeah. group just so that, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I can Action item a, one. You know. <laughs> okay. So anyways, that's my story in a nutshell. I, so you, you know, start, mentioned. You know, no. So Go you ahead. mentioned working on yourself and I love that. So yeah. a lot of the episodes we've talked about, I have this um, passion about the reality that no one wakes up one day and says, Hey, I want to be an addict. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> there is something right. underneath it. So we did episode 13 of this podcast. I talked to the head of Ripple Ranch, and we talked about the link between childhood trauma and addiction. In several episodes, mm. we talk about a lot of the underlying challenges and that, man, I would love for more and more treatment centers to be more trauma-informed and come in and say, okay, well, wait, let's not. Because, for example, for me, I am an overachiever, so I have lots of trauma, and I'll just pick whatever addiction could be available at the moment, right? To so sure. to not have to deal with that trauma with that mm -hmm. trauma. And so when you were talking about white knuckling it and all of that, mm -hmm. I hear that story a lot. Individuals who want to no longer have whatever their addiction is, and I'm just gonna say right. whatever, could be alcohol, mm -hmm. drugs, gambling, sex, it could be anything. Right. And white knuckling it. When I see individuals do that, I see miserable individuals that aren't mm -hmm. living their best life. But when I see you, I just see the glow in your face and how happy you are. And so tell me about what steps did you take to work on yourself? If you were, you're talking to me as if, okay, and you need mm -hmm. to work on yourself. What are some of the key yeah. things that you give as advice that way? The biggest thing for me, and it's been there my whole life, um, I, I had this like, it's almost like an embedded fear and, and I can't even explain it, but um, like when I get in a, say a small social group, I'm real nervous, you know? Um, so I needed to figure out a way and, you know, and I was afraid of everything, afraid of my own shadow, you know, afraid of, you know, whatever. So the way I started working on it and, and kind of outrun my fear, so to speak, was confronting people confronting people say when they're talking about somebody behind their back then with something bothering me you know not not in a, a super aggressive way like i'm going to fight this guy just just to start feeling more comfortable in my own skin so to speak you know if if somebody's <laughs> somebody might be talking about me while I'm in the room, I you know, so I might say, Hey man, when you, when you say stuff like that, you know, it's, it's upsetting. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know where you're getting off and wouldn't it be better if you talked about that guy while he was here, maybe you guys could get things sorted out, you know? And what I found when I practice this day after day, I mean, literally for months, um, I, all the things that I used to be afraid of going, God, what a wimp I was. I, I can't believe it. B because the fear was the biggest trigger for me to drink. If I was in a tough situation, four beers, go to the situation. Everything's easy I can now. totally relate. I can tell. Yeah. You know what? I think it's so funny. I love that you're telling the story because I see people like you and I. So listeners. <laughs> You're already going to have heard the intro to know who Mark is. And so you're on stage and you're performing. And in my role, I'm I'm not a famous person, but 
and my role, I lead companies and people see, I know this is what from and from my experience, people see me and they are like, oh, you're such an extrovert. You command the room. You do all these things. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I am very much an introvert. I very much have to force myself to, mm -hmm. I have to do this like, okay, you're going to have to flip the switch and go into executive and do these things. And I'm glad that I'm, I'm grateful that I'm able to do that. However, I can totally relate to the instance of, okay, I need to drink a couple of glasses of wine so that yeah. I can be social and all of that because social anxiety yeah. is huge. And people assume when they see individuals like us that we don't have those fears and those struggles. So I'm so grateful for you right. sharing that. Yeah. That's so yeah, powerful. Fear, I, I fear, you know, almost everybody I've worked with has uh, some level of fear, and, you know, so that that is a giant trigger. Um, say, you know, for people that are getting sober and they're in the early stages, they got, you know, they're going on 60 days and whatnot. And, you know, they'll get hit with a, a tough moment, like a, a fearful moment. And it's a huge trigger. They just want to, you know, grab that drink out of the sky and start going, you know, because that. So that's why I say to identify these things early, you know, and the effort moment too is going to happen a lot. As soon as you're frustrated, you're going to say, screw this. I'm just going to drink. This ain't working. It's not for me or whatever, you know what I mean? But if you've identified that in advance, you already know that little devil man's coming around. You go, yeah, right. <laughs> like, I'm really going to drink over getting pissed off. Are you kidding me? No way. I'm not going to blow my 43 days <laughs> over because I'm a little angry now. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, so that that's why I, I think identifying. Because when you fight through this, the trenches of early recovery, it, it it starts to get a little easier, you know, you and you don't get the urge as much that space in between urges is like huge. And um, so that's it. It's, it's basically, you know, a shield, uh, you know, something to keep your guard up. Just have, you know, have your tools in place. Be ready for that, you know, that thing. You know, there, there's certain things, and those are the two biggest for me were were the fear, and and getting angry, getting frustrated. You know, I had to watch all that stuff, and I did it by hanging out with people too that that were compulsive like me. You know, because I've been compulsive my whole life. Everything I do, I have to do like insane, like you know, ditto, if, if, ditto. If, if I do something, I, I've got to be the best in the world at it. I'm going to do it for 12 hours a day. And just go. I, I'm like a crazy man, you know, and that's the way I treated alcohol. I wasn't, I didn't roll out of bed, you know, into a bottle of whiskey, but I drank beer like a damn crazy man. And I got probably real close to the same amount of pain as somebody that does roll out of bed into a whiskey bottle. Because I, I always had a beer in my hand. I drank like a mo. I mean, just every day. And I got all the pain that, you know, a guy that drinks vodka, maybe it didn't eat my insides alive as bad, but it, it's, I, I got all the pain and the guilt and the shame. It, it shows up so large when I would wake up. I'd be so like afraid, you know, like shaky. And, and guilty and shameful and I looked awful and it, it, it's it's such a dark place it's the darkest life it, it's the darkest world you could ever live in and, and you're trying to escape it all the time so that's why I say chasing normal because I want yeah. to outrun this darkness and at least try to feel okay you know so it's it, it, it's just a vicious circle of, of just trying to get well all the time to where all you have to do is not do what you're doing. And you wake up feeling similar every day. You got all these tools. You're working with other people with your problem, you know, and it, it's, uh, it, it's a lot of fun to watch people get well. 
That's what I realized. I was really a selfish alcoholic. You know, this is my body. It's my life. You don't know. We, you know, this is, what are you worried about? This ain't you. You know, I had that attitude. Like, you know, people say, you know, you should really get help, bro. You're, you're, you're a hot mess. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so. Because the reality know. is we're not fooling anyone we think we're fooling. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing is, is, is people didn't tell me what a mess I was until after I got sober. I'm going, you, you should have thrown some of these bullets at me when I was, you know, hurt. And, uh, you know, so once I got sober, they're going, yeah, you know, because I thought I'd have friends that would say, hey, what's with the lightweight vibe? You know what? You can't have a couple of beers. You know, what's the deal? You know, because normies, that's the way they think. They have no yes. idea that we're, you know, full-blown addicts or a nightmare. They they don't, why don't you just stop? I mean, you know, that's the kind of things they'll say. But I was wor- I was kind of worried. But what happened was the people that I only had drinking in common with, I didn't have to force anything. They just disappeared on their own. And and the people that cared about me, they they would just, They'd say, dude, I'm so happy for you. So happy you, you quit drinking. It, it, you were really, I was worried about you. Seriously. It, that's, what, that's the kind of feedback I got. But it, That's it, amazing. Well, yeah. I'm thinking too, just tying to what you're saying, because, you know, a struggle that I have, and I can, I'm confident you can relate in the industry that you're in, is mm-hmm. that alcohol is so prevalent, right? So where I'm at in California, all of our business meetings, we have team building happy hours every other week. It is, and, and it is, and, and I also find for myself, what's interesting is I have several employees on my team who, who do, who don't drink. And when other people are offering them drinks, I'm so fast to speak up and say, this individual doesn't drink. Like they never drank. Why? And it's like, whoa, wait, why am I so, it's so easy to speak up and advocate for somebody else than yeah. it is for myself. Right. In that instance, like the slippery slope for myself. I, I realized that right away. I used to think at parties, like everyone's drinking, everybody has a semi buzz until I got sober. I had to go to this guitar, can you know, kind of thing my, I endorsed this company and they had a company party. I'm at the party and and I'm going, check it out. That guy's not drinking. That chick over there is not drinking. You, you know, they all had glasses, but they weren't drinking alcohol. And I used to think everybody was. And I ran into a dude with that had 13 years sobriety and I just hung with them all night, you know, just talking, talking shop, if you will. It was a real early part of my recovery, but I used to think everybody at a party was drinking. I, I had no idea, but yeah, I know what you mean. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a trip, but you know, I, I don't really equate what I do for a living, you know, it, the reason for, you know, I could work in a cubicle somewhere and I'd still be marked into the alcoholic you know, trouble case, <laughs> you know, or whatever. So, but it, as far as the availability and it being around and stuff like that, yeah, sure. I, I mean, you know, but it's everywhere. I, you know, today, you know, these days, I mean, I don't really even think it bothered me early. I was so focused on trying to stay sober today. I didn't, it didn't really bother me if somebody was drinking or whatever, but I wasn't around it a lot. You know, I, I wasn't hanging out at bars or anything, you know, <laughs> either. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, it's around. I, and I, I, I have friends who drink. I mean, you know, like normal drinker guys. And um, yeah, it just doesn't bother me anymore, you know. If somebody you know starts what I found? bidding on me or something, you know, they're so wasted. I mean, of course, I'm like, hey, man, it's raining in here. What's going on? <laughs> you know, one thing that I've I've also found out is um, I've read 
quite a few books recently and also of several authors of recovery books that have been on the podcast that have episodes coming up soon. One of which is Craving Recovery. And I'm super excited. It's a three-part series that I'll release. And it's Joshua. And he talks about his his experience going into rehab. And he talks about the fact that he could not get sober until he was able to talk about his childhood trauma. And then I was able to interview his wife, Sasha, and get her perspective on it. And then mm-hmm. I did a third interview of her talking about her own personal experience. It was really exciting of that. But another Fantastic. book that I'm... Another book that I love is the book, The the Unexpected Joy of Being Sober, which I just think more and more people, I've read it now four times. And it's amazing when you read it and I think, oh, I can completely relate to that. And I can completely relate to to so many of those pieces. So as part of reading that book and thinking about the impact of drugs and alcohol and just different levels of addiction, so also a book like Dopamine Nation for Anna Lemke is that we've had now conversations in this actual room in my office with other team members. And I've learned really the number of people in my age group that I work with that seriously want to reduce their intake of alcohol and struggle with it Mm. is a lot. And Mm. so then it makes me think individuals like yourself that are so passionate about it and so happy and joyful and eager to see other people, the more that's out there and the more people are willing to talk about it, then the more those individuals can feel like it's safe to say, okay, I have a problem and I need help and I want help versus trying to hide it in, you know, a a view of society or work or or what is quote unquote normal. You know what I, uh, I really enjoy it. And even today, like uh, when I go to this fellowship, I'll just call it a fellowship type meeting where people share and almost every share, even, I mean, for years this has been happening. Everybody's telling my story. I mean, you know, so I really realize I'm in the right place because, you know, I, I even, I used to take out the trash, you know, and I would like slam two beers as fast as I could. You know, I'm like an alcoholic, you know, I sneak around and, you know, and somebody was telling their story one time and they said, I used to take out the trash and take a few swigs or whatever. <laughs> I'm going, I thought I totally wrote that, man. I, I thought that was mine, you know? And I, I just realized, <laughs> yeah, you can't, you know, because alcoholics, you know, we're sneaky. Um, and we're also town planners. That's the other thing. It's like in early recovery, you got to watch out for this. Like you have this, this window of space where nobody would know if you drank. And so your your town planning, it's like in advance, like I'm gonna drink in this little spot right here because I know nobody will find out. But I mean, that's just, it, it's, you're thinking it's like, I've heard uh, Steven Tyler, who's a good buddy of mine, uh, he, he equates and he fought a lot of addictions. He had sex addiction. He went from this addiction to that. And as soon as it started getting rampant, he would go fix it. He would go to a rehab or do something. So, but he said, it's like living your life, your whole life in the ocean. And then you go to dry land and you go like, Hey, I'm okay here. You know, like everything's working out, but every second you're thinking about going back in, you know what I mean? It's like, you're okay here, but (laughs) I'm going to hang here forever, you know, and that's the way early recovery is. You're, you're, you know, the thoughts are just overwhelming and your emotions. The obsession of the mind. Yeah. Your mind just plays tricks on you. You're, you're so used to, you know, living bad, living wrong, that it's hard to live right early. So it's, it's really tough, you know. But fellowship, I think, is a good thing. You know, if you're alone a lot in early recovery, you know, you're thinking, you're sporadic, you're crazy. But if you're hanging out with people that have your problem, like like the way Bill W. or whatever figured it out years ago, it's like instead of going to talk to a psychiatrist, I need to talk to another drunk. I need to talk to somebody like me. Somebody can relate, not some, you know, 
book read, you know, you know, guy with his masters and expert on everything. I need to talk to somebody who's just a nightmare like I am. And, and, and they realized that fellowship was so, was the answer. It, it's like, because you can relate, God, hey, that guy's just like me, you know? And, and he's pretty good to hang out with. And maybe we can keep each other sober, you know, keep each other well. And then they start bringing it to other people. It was just a seed that, that just grew. That's why I love, I love to speak at meetings. I love to hear people's stories. But like I said before we started, that I I don't promote any rehab centers or any certain groups publicly. Um, privately, sure, I, I will, you know, if I'm helping somebody or guiding someone that I think is kind of the right way. They don't have to do it. Like I say, you know, there's a lot of different well, I think ways it's all do. about saying, okay, here are some tools and resources that I've found helpful that I'm going to yeah. hand out to you. And mm -hmm. I can walk you through these. And then as you're going along your journey, if you find additional tools and items that you find helpful and assistance, share them. Because I yeah. one episode we talk about I love centers that have a diverse level of different items they make available for individuals who are there. So such as they may do EMDR or they may do yoga or there's just a lot of many modalities. And the reason that I love that is because I think that the tools that will work for one individual may be completely different than the tools that will work for somebody else. And as you mentioned, the goal is to heal the being of the human being, you know, not just, it's easy to go into rehab, quote unquote easy, to go into rehab for 30, 40 days and take away whatever the substance is. Yeah. However, when you just go back out and the substance is everywhere, if you haven't done any of the, figured out some tools like you mentioned. Yeah. So what are your, some of your favorite tools? So some are, as I've heard you say, is helping another addict is one of your favorite tools for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other ones you use? Like, are you into meditation or mindfulness no. or yoga or do you hate all of those? And are you sitting no. here saying, and why did you say that? <laughs> no, no. And now that, um, I, I really don't meditate as much as I pray, but I read meditation a lot. And a friend of mine, who I think he has about 11 years uh, sober, maybe 12. We send each other literally every single day. We text each other our gratitude list. Yes, I was hoping <laughs> you, know you would say I mean? that. Love we're, it. We're like, I'm grateful for another day sober. And then we say all the things, the smallest things that we're grateful for, you know. And he's always early. I, I, I don't come until nighttime because, you know. I just, I don't roll out of bed and just go, okay, I'm grateful for this and that. And, you know, and he, he's, he wakes up with the chickens and, and just hits me with this deal. But I, I send out the prayers and the, and it's it, daily affirmations. You know, it has uh, thought for the day, uh, meditation, prayer, you know, messages, things to maybe help you. It, it, just like something to read with your coffee in the morning or whatever, you know. And there's usually some pretty, a lot of wisdom in, in a lot of the thoughts for the day and stuff that you go, man, that came at a perfect time. God, Doesn't it always? Believe... Yes. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it does. I mean, people will say, tell me uh, or send me an email or, or uh, tell me in some fashion that how this hit home so much. It's, it's just unbelievable. Uh so we talk a lot about gratitude lists on this podcast. Episode five, we talked about self-care. And Linda yeah. talked about how I kind of bullied her into doing gratitude lists. And so I want to share with the audience, because I love what you said. Some individuals think, oh, I can't think of that many things that I'm grateful for. But it can be simple. My gratitude list for yesterday was one, friends who get me. Two, electrolyte drinks I like because I'm still struggling with drinking alcohol and I drank too much the night before. Three, uh -huh. upcoming time off work. Four, 
um, a, a vet within walking distance to work for my service dog Harley's vaccination, and five yeah. inside jokes and fun banter at work. So <laughs> simple <laughs> things to be grateful for. Yeah. I'm dying to know what your gratitude items were. Uh, this is just like he numbers his, and I, I all I just said, I go thanks Tang. His, his name's Tang. You know. <laughs> coolest guy he used to, like the best he was the best pool player he was such a good pool player at one time it's like amazing but anyway i said grateful for my sober life today uh kale west holiday interview my new radio show great white shows pouring in for next year finally a local show i can drive to in february positive vibes from kale this morning who's uh my uh, brother-in-law who's uh, in early recovery a anyways he, he was going through a tough spot where he he was in effort mode he, he was real yeah. angry and, and i was telling tang in an earlier uh grateful thing about it but i said uh positive vibes from kale this morning who fought through his dark moment without drinking yesterday i said looking forward to holiday season with family and anticipating my granddaughter. Woohoo! Love it. So, it, it. We just do it, you know. It, um, he came up with that. He just sent me a list, and I, I just, I sent him back one. This is, we just started doing this like three weeks ago, but it's it's an everyday thing. So I'm sending out prayers. I'm doing this, that, and the other. I'm doing these podcasts. I'm like, you know, sending him a gratitude. I usually do it at night, you know. But uh, it's awesome. You're absolutely, you're absolutely going to love it. I started doing it a couple of years ago. And at one point was sending gratitude lists to close to 30 friends. And I will admit, it became almost like a job to me. And so I've been the slacker of it. I do still send yeah. it to a couple of friends because they send me theirs. And yeah, okay. in episode five, Linda talks about it. She said, I actually just started doing it just so that I could keep, she could keep tabs on me because she was worried about me and my mental health. And so when I started oh, doing wow. gratitude yeah. lists, she said, okay, I'm going to do gratitude lists just so I can kind of keep tabs on Ange. And, yeah. and now she's, she's the best and she's on the East coast. I'm on the West coast. So I get her list. And yeah. the thing I love about hearing you share the tools, so including praying and, and some of those, is uh, when I read someone's gratitude list or when you were reading yours, I instantly thought there are several things you said that I need to remember to be grateful for. So it instantly uh, brought joy to me just hearing your gratitude list, which is uh, such a gift. You know, you were talking about, you know, tragedy early, maybe even childhood stuff. Um, you know, you, you've been through the kidnapping and everything. You know, I think a lot of times people have buried things so deep that they don't even know they're there, but it affects them in some way, their life. They, uh, you know, so when you get together with somebody and you're trying to work on yourself, a lot of times it might come up if you're going through your life and talking about it and remember and all of a sudden that that bad memory pops into your head and you can maybe work through it but a lot of people uh bury things and just they've just escaped it but it's still there and it's uh, that cleansing is like really killer if if you can get that handled you you feel like you've been reborn uh, you know and working through my character defect wasn't easy and it's still ongoing now in some degree i i have to exercise this stuff i have to practice it and and it does become more natural after a while but um you know you want to be a better person you go god i'm removing this alcohol from my life i i want to become a, a you know I want to become a worthy person, not just dig me on bitching. I, I want to be the guy that, you know, caring and loving person, you know, I don't, I don't just want to be this dig me on bitching person. I, I want to 
see people get well. I want to maybe contribute because I think life itself, if if you don't have any contribution, it's like it's almost like you just exist. You know, you might as well just lay there like a slug and and just wave to people going by or something. I I just think that you know we can all do good things. I mean, you know, but I I never. I'm a fan of getting attention for anything. I, I'm really not doing it. it it'd be like, uh, oh, yeah, I just donated to a charity and you post the, the amount of money you sent. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, okay, no one no one cares about that. But, I mean, yeah, exactly. I, I get a, 100% what you're saying. Have you ever read the poem, The Dash? I haven't. Oh, my gosh. I, I'll have to you, trip on you, it, though. Yes, read a lot yes. of poems, a lot of poems. It is, it is amazing. But my, it is, it is basically, I'll give you the, uh, the summary of it and mm-hmm. listeners all include it in the show notes. But the, the premise of it is someone is talking at a funeral and said, you know, when you look at the tombstone, you see two dates. One is a date of celebration. It's the date of birth. And the other is a date of mourning. It's the date of passing. But what often most people miss is that dash in the middle. And that dash represents all of the time that you have on earth and all the opportunities you have to live your best life. And the reality is, I believe so many people give up the opportunity to fully live that dash. And so the reality is, is that my perspective is I only have today and in fact, the quote that I have on my back wall is my own personal quote. And it's like, you only have one opportunity to live, to make a difference mm-hmm. and to build a legacy, make it count. Mm-hmm. So live the dash. Yeah. I think you will love, you will love that poem. I'm, I'm going to read it. I, yeah. Um, you know, but this isn't the way I've lived my whole life. Like I, I was saying, when I was in, you know, my disease, let's just call it my disease when I was in my disease, I, I wasn't the greatest person, you know what I mean? And to to understand that I can actually, actually change that and remove the alcohol and treat myself better, it, it, it's really quite the miracle. It really is. And uh, And then, you know, wanting other people to feel that miracle too, when I started to see the miracle work for others, it, it's the most, I, I, I mean, nothing could happen for me monetarily or any, you couldn't give me anything that would make me feel like I do when someone very sick gets very well. It, it, you can't believe it. Now, I'm just saying, I'm I'm being truthful here. I'm being an honest person. I am an honest person, honest person today. The feeling I get, it, it's hard to explain. It, it's like, uh, it's spiritual. It, it's, it, it's like I, I get, a, a, I, I can't even explain the feeling I get. But, but to see America, it, it's like witnessing a miracle, like something that's not even, like doable aliens from outer space came down and I saw the guy, you know, it's almost like that, but this is like somebody got well, that was probably going to die. This, this is pretty freaking awesome. I mean, and the people that surround this guy, they're all happy. So it's not just this one person all isolated in a little cubicle. This, this, circle of friends, people he grew up with, his family, his mom, dad, sister, brother, kids, whatever. They're all happy, you know? So it's pretty neat that to be involved with this. It's almost like an addiction just to, you know, be involved with it. I think it. I'm going to say it totally is because I feel like it's an addiction for me. And, you know, when I first went into treatment, especially after the kidnapping, uh, because when my kidnapper was preparing to uh, send me into the sex trade, so I had instances in the kidnapping where when I came out, I didn't want to. Ex- I didn't want to talk about how I experienced anything in my body. 
And so it took me a while when my therapist would say, well, where do you feel X, Y, and Z in your body? And I'm like, I don't even want to talk about that. Like, let's move on. Actually, that therapist listens to this podcast, so she's going to laugh when she hears this. But <laughs> when, you were just, when you were just describing that feeling, I yeah. can relate. So me and when I hear stories of healing and recovery and yeah. that... It is, I feel in my, like my chest, my heart just wants to explode. I feel like my skin just has tingles all over it. I just feel in my gut where I just have this burst of energy around me that's just like ready to, it is the greatest dopamine high ever. (laughs) And in fact, speaking of the dopamine high, I was talking with my therapist once because This was when the podcast really started doing really well, which was unexpected. It wasn't intentional. The podcast was solely just to reduce the stigma and educate. That was the point of the podcast. I'm grateful that it's doing well. It was not intentional. But when it first did and I started getting listeners saying, wow, I listened to the boundaries episode. I didn't know I could say no like that. When I started getting those things, the dopamine, yeah, the dopamine high in that period for me was so high that I suddenly went through a week where I was very depressed and I couldn't figure out why. And it was when I was talking with my therapist and, and knowledge and learning things that I suddenly realized, oh, it's because I had this huge high of all of these people who were sharing how much this meant to them that suddenly my body was just like, okay, I'm now going to crash. And, and realizing that it allowed me to kind of like process it and deal with it and and move on. It was in a very healthy way and not Mm. decide, okay, I'm going to pick up an addiction or something like that. But yeah, that's how it, so back to how it feels my body, like to see someone that goes from living just like a a life of misery to and the other part that you mentioned like the people around them it's why ran is so passionate about these bridge grants because when individuals are in treatment and they suddenly get cut off by insurance they literally get shipped home the next day they don't have like plans on and so then they're going back into their community and they're not going back as fully functioning individuals who can thrive and be great parts of the community they're going to. And that's just a disservice to everyone. It it was very difficult. The very first time I went into rehab for 30 days, it was weird going out into the street and even like going to 7-Eleven was like a nightmare. I I, I was just like scared to death of everything. And I had to go straight to the Capitol Records parking lot and and celebrate the release of an album and play on stage for like a wow. thousand, thousand people straight out of this rehab. It was like thrown to the wolves immediately. It was like I couldn't ease into anything. You know what I mean? That was like, it's... Uh, when you're confined, I mean, confined, I mean, I'm around people, but you know, you're, you're isolated from the world. Even for 30 days, when you first go back into the world, it's a trip, man. I mean, you know, the other thing is, is going back to your same life, like your same circle of friends, you know, usually I don't know. It it doesn't get the best result unless you're really working this thing a day at a time and, and, you know, really stay focused on treating yourself well and and listen to these guys. I would, the way I change things when I decided in 2008, November 2nd, to get to do this for real and not have one foot in the door. This is that the way they say it, one foot in the door and one out. Because yeah. I would look at the clock when I'd go to meetings. Just you know, I can't wait till this damn thing's over with. <laughs> let's, get, let's get this horrible thing over with. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and that's the attitude I have. But I showed up, you know. But I didn't love being there. And and so after failing, because I'm, like I said earlier about being jealous of people that drink normal, I would go two years without drinking. Okay, and I, I'm going to try it again. This time, I am going to be 
Joe and the normal drinking Joe, you know, having right. two beers and watch the game with the boys and I'm not going to drink the next day, you know, and all this. And I try it and be okay for a few days. And then pretty soon the cycle started all over again, pain, uh, you know, so it was a joke, but I, I, I kept going on with that. And, you know, it, it's, it's just vicious. Um, I forgot where I was going. I, I got sidetracked there, but, uh, what advice would you get? Well, we're talking about going out into the community yeah. and uh, people, places, and things. Yeah. And well, how, I just think the listening, I know where, where I was. It, it's like, I, I want the guy that has 30 years recovery time to kind of tell me how he did it. And, and I kind of, in the beginning, I, I just want to follow direction. I, I want to, you know, because I, I want to be successful at, at this thing. And, you know, and it's more than just removing alcohol. It, it's, or whatever your drug of choice is, it, just removing that is not going to get it done. You really got to do that self work. You, you have to change something and uh, your thinking pattern, you know, and your, your habits and, you know, it's uh, so that that's the way I w I've had success so far. But I still, you know, with time, like I said, it takes care of itself. So I have nothing to do with the 15 years it rolled by. I just stayed sober today. You know, I, that's all I do. I Every day, all I do is put that one day in front of me. I can, there's not much you can't do in one day. I mean, you know, as far as like uh, today, I, I'm not going to drink Dr. Pepper. Uh, uh, you know, you wake up the next day. Today, I am not going to drink Dr. Pepper. It's my doctor said the fat. And so you're only doing this stuff, uh, you know, one day at a, you know, like a 24 hour period. So it, it makes it's not impossible. I mean, you know, you, you can do it. Um, so it's work, but it, it's uh, well worth it. My life is so good today. It, it, it completely freaks me out how good it is, you know, and it's been going on like this for a while. So that's why I hang on to this one day with for dear life, because I don't, I know how easy it is to go back into that dark world like that. Right. I've seen it happen to guys with 20 plus years sobriety. They go out, they drink once, they end up dead or something bad happens. I, I'm telling you, you know, when they say, they told me this is one thing I did not believe. And this is my first rehab. I didn't believe everything they told me, but I would listen. I was attentive. But when they said this disease is progressive, like if you go back and drink, it's going to be worse than when you quit. I didn't believe it until I tried it. And it took me no time to get back and worse than I was. More pain, more everything. So it's it's a learning process, man. I've learned so much about uh, myself. Um, you know, it's not a person I really knew that well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've heard that so much moi. from individuals too. <laughs> yeah, individuals yeah. who say, I didn't, I didn't actually know myself when I was an addict. Yeah. It wasn't until, which I, I will repeat this 10 bazillion times. I do not want the world to be full of addicts. However, I think it would be phenomenal if in middle school, everyone did the 12 steps for whatever program and learned those things because uh, myself in, a, in another program that I'm in and I have a phenomenal sponsor and I, I agree with finding someone with solid. So when I was looking at that program for a sponsor, I found someone who had very solid recovery and just did what he said to do. And, uh, and he, but he's all into, tell me how you're feeling. He's all into feelings. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, do we really have to talk about <laughs> feelings today? I don't want to talk about feelings, but I'll talk about feelings because that's what he said to do. And it keeps me sober. But, um, but so I think that, and now I lost my train of thought. See, this is what feel, thinking about feelings does to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's all his folly throws me off. My favorite step is step four because it's the one I worked on the most. Is like There we go. And the here, steps. I go to my sponsor <laughs> and I'd show him my step four. It's like, you know, 11 pages long. Right. And, and 
I, I'm all happy, like I'm badass, you know. I, I, I finished number four, right? And, uh, and, he, goes, and he hands it back to you. You ain't done yet, boy. Yeah, so that's so, what I meant. Like walking I, through that, you learn about yourself, right? Oh, man. That's how I learned the most about myself uh, doing moral inventory. And I'm telling you, man, did I learn a lot about me. You know, because how often are you going to sit down and just roll out of bed and just go, you know what, I'm just going to sit here today and do some moral inventory on my show. <laughs> on my character defects. You know, the, the thing that I love about it, when you start working with sponsees and other individuals, okay, yeah. every newcomer is like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to say all the awful things I've done because my sponsor and everyone's going to think I'm the world's worst person. And then they share their fourth step and their sponsor's like, yep, sounds about right. You know, and the thing yeah. I like about it is I think that individuals, I myself realized we are all human. It just humanizes yeah. all of us. We Big all thing. have our mistakes. They're yeah. different. We all screwed up on things. And yet by yeah. sharing them vulnerably, allows us to see each other as amazing human beings. Absolutely. You know, some of these, like I was telling you about uh, these thoughts for the day, they're kind of, uh, you know, they go on and they, and they talk about that in one, um, about if, if you go through your life, you know, worried you're going to make a mistake. I mean, it's like that fear of making a mistake. It's, it's just like, you can't live like that. You, I can't remember exactly the the language uh, in in the thought, but it was just pretty like wise stuff, you know. Um, it's, Growth it's happens I when you make reading, mistakes. I love reading this stuff, and I, and I'll get your email later. And and yes. if you're interested in getting it daily, I'll I add am. You. Okay, you, you'll take it. Absolutely, I mean, I'm it's, in. It's really cool stuff, man. It, Dude, it's, I'm uh, it's I'm neat. in. So uh, two things, or three things, rather. One, what, and I'm going to go ahead and give you all three of them so I don't forget. One, what thoughts, motivation, encouragement would you give to the loved ones of the addicts who are sitting here watching them go in and out? So that's one. Two, yeah. is there anything you were really hoping we would cover that we haven't? And three, I hope you brought your favorite motivational quote because that is a requirement of this podcast. Okay. I always suggest you go into Al Anon meeting just so you understand what an addict is. Because um, I never take someone's addiction personally. You know, uh, I don't care how many times they go out and they blow it. You know, I, I'm just hoping that they'll come back because a lot of times it, it's part of the recovery process are relapses and stuff like that. But are you going to pick yourself back up and try again? That That's where, and I understand that families go through a, a horrid time watching a loved one, you know, um, in their disease. And, and a lot of times the families are funding their drug of choice. And I don't think that's the answer. Um, instead of putting yourself through that torture, I think tough love, even though it doesn't always work out, is the best thing for you and them. You know, if you're funding their death, um, that doesn't work, right? Um, so the best thing for you is to do the tough love and say, you know, I'm not going to finance your drugs anymore or your alcohol. Um, if you want to seek treatment, get well, we'll even help with that. You know, um, you, you got to be willing, you know, because the way you're living your life right now is not working and you need to change something or you're going to die. And we don't want to watch you die. We shouldn't have to put ourselves through this. And I'm certainly not into financing your death. You know, that would be my thinking and what I've seen work. And it actually does work. A lot of times the tough love 
you know, have a little intervention. A lot of times they'll break down, you know, uh, and they'll go, okay, you know, I'm get me help, you know. So I think tough love. I'm going to remember that financing your financing your death. I was I was talking with my therapist earlier this morning, and we were talking about the my nonprofit and the podcast and different ways to raise funds. And he was talking about he trying to set up in Monterey a program to help homeless individuals get into treatment. And he he was said, you know, the number of times I'd be so frustrated, I would finally get a bed for someone. And someone would, and, and the individual will be panhandling and someone would give him a hundred dollar bill. And so then that individual wouldn't show up for the bed in the treatment center because they got a hundred dollar bill. And he's just saying to people, okay, don't give them a hundred dollar bill. You're basically just, you know, financing their death in that instance, allow them yeah. to get into the bed. So he was, he was talking very much about this very scenario that you're talking about, but I've never yeah. heard it said like that. And I absolutely am going to steal that. <laughs> I'm okay. going to say a good friend of mine said this. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, 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 it's it, the thing about us selfish alcoholics is is our mindset is we're just doing this to ourselves we completely exclude the people who love us when we're in our addiction you know this is my body this and i treat you know so you're you're just completely discarding the people who love you. and they are going through a lot of pain watching you hurt yourself so but our thinking is, well, can you give me more money? <laughs> you know, it's pretty bad. And so on the end of the family with the addict, I just think it's best do the tough love thing, do all you can to help them, but not financially. I just don't think that's right, especially if they're not doing any, making any effort, you know. Addiction, I respect it. I, I I totally respect someone. I don't take it personal. Never have taken anybody's addiction personally. But man, you got to get help. You know, I really, I really hope for everyone that's suffering to get help because it's available. There's this other life that's available. It's right there in an arm's length reach. You can do it. I mean, you don't have to be in pain all the time and have this dark world. You know, there, there's a total, this other place that's badass. I've seen it firsthand that available to every single person suffering out there. Every single one of you can have this life. I mean, you got to be a little patient. It ain't going to come and just bite you right out of the gate, but but it will get better. Everybody that told me my life is going to get better were absolutely spot on. It's, man, it, it, it's, it's quite the miracle. I, I don't remember your second question. Well, the second uh, question was, what do you, was there something you wanted to cover that we haven't already covered today? Well, I think what I just now spoke about is it, um, is something I like to cover because, uh, like, we overly talked about it. But you know, a lot of times I think people want to be sober. I think they're they're kind of tired of you know creating injury towards their spouses or their kids. You know, because your kids. You know, a lot of people think kids don't know what the hell's going on. What does he know? He's seven years old. You know, I knew every single thing about every quirk of my father when I was eight years old. I knew where his pot was. I knew where his joints were. I knew where his cross top speed was. He used to fall out of his pocket. I knew where all his empty bottles were. They were in his coat pockets in the closet. I'm eight. They think I'm just a stupid little kid. That you know plays baseball every once in a while, likes riding mini bikes. No, man, I'm. An, I know exactly what you're doing, dude. I mean, you know, you're not fooling no one. You know, but but it hurts too. I, I used to see my dad get drunk, not a violent alcoholic. You know, happy Joe. You know, 
but he he would like drive or you know he'd do things that scare me and i used to get scared if i thought my parents were going to break up if they got in like this kind of verbal argument so you know kids cannot stand to watch their parents injure themselves you know and uh so I just think it's a more positive life. And we aren't talking about people that go out and have a social drink with their friends and, and have enjoyment. We're talking about problem cases. I mean, like literally where their life's consumed with their drug or alcohol and it's affecting everyone around them, the responsibilities, you know, creating a lot of pain. So those are the people I'm speaking to, you know, the ones normal I've heard, I mean, just occasionally, it's probably like under 1% that will say, why can't you guys just quit, man? <laughs> Shit. Why do you got to go through when all this I, stuff? When I hear that, especially when I was in eating disorder camp, because yeah. I'll share this, when, when I was really young, my mom was very abusive and she would feed my brothers and not feed me. And so I learned... That if I wasn't hungry, she couldn't hurt me. So then I used that skill later in life, okay? And so then I would have people say to me, why don't you just eat? So the same thing, like, why don't you just not drink? Why? And I, I finally got to the point and just said, that's a great idea. I never thought about it. Thank you so much for sharing that to me. Uh-huh. Yeah. And there it's was one more easy. thing. There was one more thing. To, so one you. more thing is, what is your favorite motivational quote, Mark? Um. I, I kind of like this one, uh, and I do remember it. It's by Bob Marley. Yes. He, sa he says, um, open your eyes, look within. Are you satisfied with the life you're living? Oh, I love that. Strong. That is strong. And happiness Mark is not a destination or, or an experience. It's a decision. A decision. I love that. But there's even Mark, better ones. When you start getting my dailies, you're going to trip. I can't wait. Oh, there's some like, there's some killer uh, thoughts for the days. Uh, really, really cool stuff, man. I will share one of my favorite ones in my office that I have yeah. right now. I'm going to grab it really quick. It, so I, I painted this sign. I think it's not turned around yet. I think you can see it. I painted this sign years ago, but it's every great story on the planet happened when someone decided not to give up. Great. Love it. Inspiring. Well, Mark, this has been amazing. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful. Thanks for having me on your show. And uh, hopefully, you know, if there's anybody out there, you know, kind of in trouble or whatever, maybe they can take a couple things out of here and, you know, hopefully they're inspired enough to, you know, try to get well, you know, get on the road to recovery and, uh, that, that's, if they were not inspired by what you shared, I don't know what, because I was so inspired by what you shared. It was amazing. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> Whatever it is, we were escaping. It, well, with me, it was fear. Um, and my and my compulsive thing, you know, I'm comp so damn compulsive. I, I just... You know, I um, was thinking, and I had cut out the recording, but then I turned it back on, Um yeah, I love I love the analogy you just said because yes, other people haven't been kidnapped, but a hundred percent, you're right. We're all in some ways trying to escape something, yeah, and using something. And then the compulsive part. I was just in Vegas with my coworker. We did not stay on the strip. We we did old lady Vegas. We stayed at at, at a resort. You know, we saw Michael Jackson, so Cirque du Soleil. We spent a day at the spa. We slept in late. And, um, but she had said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go and, um, gamble, but I'm only going to like $200 was her limit. Perfect. And so I went and sat and watched her and people were like, are you not going to gamble? And I was like, no, I've never gambled. And I will tell you this. I know Angela's personality. If I were to gamble, I would get addicted to gambling and I would ruin my life. I have a compulsive personality. I know yeah. exactly what would happen. I've never done, thank goodness, I've never done drugs. I've I had alcohol, but I've never done drugs because when I was yeah. 15 and I saw yeah. the girl shooting up in the bathroom, I said, Whoa. if I do drugs, I will probably be on the street as a prostitute or dead. I just knew yeah. that in my personality. 
And I'm so grateful. And because I know these things, I do not judge anyone who's living no. any of those lives because right. it could very well have been me if I had just made sure. one different decision. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, you know, we didn't really touch on this, but like when you're working on your addiction, you kind of got to watch yourself because of that compulsive thing that you don't want to get addicted to something else that's not so good for you. You yes. know what I mean? Is yep. that, that can happen too. You know, some people might, uh, you know, be an alcoholic and they get well and done all this inventory and become sex addicts, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or become some other kind of addict and start, you know, wailing away at that. So we got to police ourselves, you know, try, trying to live right. One day at a time, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> this is just one day, man. You can do it. You can do anything for one, one day. day. Absolutely. You. Well, Mark, I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thanks for having. I don't know. People are amazing. People are I'm amazing. The same, and... I'm the same exact way. You know. Um, you know, we have fans and whatnot, but I'm a fan myself, so I'm I'm not on any pedestal in my own mind because. As much as these people might like our music and maybe it was part of their lives when they were in high school, some song came out. But I have songs where, when I was in high school that came out too. So I'm not on any pedestal. I'm at the same level as, as fans of my own band, you know, because I relate to it because I'm such a geeky fan myself. So, <laughs> so I relate to all this stuff, you know, and I know I think I know what a fan would like from their heroes. And I think that's a little bit of behind the scenes. What are they yes. up to? What, what's going on backstage? Maybe, maybe not even backstage, but their home life or, you know, you don't want to probe into uh, too much privacy, but you know, what, it, what goes on with these people? You know, what, what kind of a life did they have before their band went huge also is, is, is it really interesting because a lot of these bands like even like uh say ario speedwagon or something like that they had two albums that totally failed until the third one came out you know what i mean which is a great so, story right it's a great Individuals story for this that. reason here's why it's a great story that the overnight success that you hear about doesn't exist no and i, I kind of know this because every single band that i've researched and their stories is always this hardcore grinding nightmare. And you can't believe they didn't just give it up. I mean, it's just bizarre. And it's not like a low or like 60% of the bands, you know, I, this is like 100% of the bands have some kind of a grinding, you know, shot down by everybody and everybody hated them. And then this one guy showed up that helped them, you know, that that's really our story. And, you know, uh, we were so unlikely to make it, you know, during the Van Halen era and all that with the sea of bands, our ads for our band, when we played like the star Wider places in Hollywood, yeah, it, it was like fly legs were used to do the the font. That's how small. <laughs> that's, how, that's how tiny our name was. I mean, you know, we were such the non-factor. It's just that somebody finally, from our relentless, uh, our relentlessness on on playing for free and just playing everywhere we could, finally there was somebody in the crowd that could help us. You know. So that really relentlessness kind of a, is it. I mean, I no. everyone I know who's been, yeah. you know, it's it's the 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 quote from A League of His Own. Anything worth doing, or uh, if it was easy, everyone would do it. The heart is what makes exactly. it great, and that exactly. is it. And when individuals yeah. say to me, um, "You've been so successful in these areas," I'm like, I I was a 29 year old single mom and went back to school to get my engineering degree at Georgia Tech. There's not a right. single part of that that was easy. Nothing's easy. Everyone I know who's been successful like this has worked really, really hard through some very dark moments. Exactly. I mean, you, you know, 
they talk about luck, but everybody that's really lucky are usually the guys that work the hardest. You know what yes. I mean? It's like you create your own luck when you're busting ass. You know, what is the and quote? It, and is... If, it was, if it was so easy to be, you know, uh, successful, everybody would do it. You know, if it was just this overnight thing. <laughs> Yeah, I want to say, and it's on one of the episodes of the podcast, so I'm, it's really bad that I'm going to get it wrong, but Oprah, when she did her tour around with, I want to say Michelle Obama, kept saying, yeah. um, luck is when opportunity meets hard work or perseverance or something like that. Yeah. Um, but, and and I'll, yeah, so I, I love that because it is exactly that. Like, no, yes, yeah. I have... We've had opportunities and, and to be in the like right sobriety, place. But... Sobriety doesn't just come out of the sky. It, it There is some work involved, but it, it's totally available. That's what I mean. And it's not like this totally grind like you're working on the railroad or something. You're working on yourself. So, I mean, it, it's it's actually kind of cool when you start getting results from that and they're positive and great results. And, and all of a sudden, the people around you they trust you now and they love you and and it, it just the accolades you get from just treating yourself well it's like insane it, it's like so it's not like your life changes and gets better just financially which can happen also but it, it's the love you receive and how it makes you feel i mean what can be better than that you know um as far as stuff, you know, like uh, your big old house and your bitching cars, that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty meaningless stuff, really. It's very uh, meaningless. You know what I mean? But to have people love you and and they're your family and you love them too, and you're kind of out of self more, you know, you're you're not so tied up into your, your your ambition trip or whatever you start caring more about others and go man this feels so good how people love me it's so awesome I love that yeah it's so awesome man and and these are the 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 gifts from a miracle the, that's why it's a miracle because it, it's just the the wonderful gifts that you get from from what comes with sobriety, you know, it, it, it's like I said, it's not just removing the alcohol. It's it's becoming something, you know, a, a person of contribution, a loving and giving person, you know, uh, who's living their best life. And it, it's very rewarding, too. It, it's quite rewarding, it, you know. One quote that I love uh, is, every life matters, including yours. Start acting like it. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very much like Dig everything it. you said. You're so inspirational. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I enjoyed uh, this podcast and meeting me and stuff. And I, I thought uh, I thought it was really good, man. Nice hearing Thank from you. you and your story, too. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate it. Well, I will be in touch. I will email you my email so that I can get on your daily stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, do that, please. And, yep, and uh, I will. I'll, I'll shoot you the daily. Thank you. I You're appreciate gonna like it. it. You're going to like I'm it. I'm going to love it. I am so stoked. <laughs> I know. It is right up my alley. I'm going to love it. And stuff, and there's some great stuff, man. I it, live like, off of yeah. That's why I have, like... Be brave, be badass on tattooed on my arm. I live off of quotes. And there's not like any religious thing involved. I mean, there's like a Buddhist quote and, you know, like, but it's mostly like of your choosing. These are just like, just nice messages and prayers and meditations. And, you know, so it's not, your. there's no certain religion attached to it or anything like that so it it's impossible to offend anyone well what a gift <laughs> to the world mark <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of your day thank you so okay, much you too.
just listened to episode number 35 with Mark Kendall of the band Great White. We hope you've been encouraged and learned something from today's story. As a reminder, the experiences and advice expressed in this episode are the host and guest own personal stories and do not represent the opinions of any organization mentioned. Ran is passionate about opening the doors for all voices and experiences, not just those expressed in any particular podcast. If you want to share your experiences or expertise, we encourage you to be a featured guest by emailing us at podcast at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org or submit a blog post by emailing blog at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org. We also encourage you to comment on the episode so that we can continue to provide content that is most beneficial to the community. We are proud that every individual working with RAN does so on a 100% volunteer basis. You can support the mission by clicking the love, not like icon on our podcast and subscribing. We hope you will also connect with us at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org where you can donate to the mission read those blog posts, and stay in the loop about upcoming events. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Recover Advocate Network and on Twitter, or X, at Brand to Wellness. So, listeners, pause what you're doing right now and make sure you subscribe, follow us, please give us a five-star rating, and provide some feedback. Share these episodes with your friends. You never know whose hearts you will touch, so please be a part of the reason someone has new hope today. If this episode was triggering to you, we encourage you to contact your support system, therapist, national and community support groups, the Global Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741, and and if you're in the U.S., dialing 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you're in the U.S. and need additional resources such as shelter, support group resources, transportation, food, and or a safe, confidential path out of physical or emotional domestic abuse, please call 211 or visit www.211info.org for assistance. We are so grateful that you joined us today. We know you're very busy. And so thank you for saying yes to spending time with us. Until next time, relax and back to your coffee.